Hello and welcome to Resilience, the global adaptation podcast, the show where we'll be exploring the best solutions and cutting edge technologies for adapting to climate change. From floating cities to flood resilient farms to forest seawalls, we're coming to you from the UN's Global Adaptation Network. I'm Liz Mullen Bernhardt. And I'm Marcus Neild. In our podcast, we'll be talking to the most renowned adaptation experts, but we'll also be traveling around the world, virtually of course, to meet people and communities on the front lines to learn about how they've built resilience on the ground. We're really excited to share some amazing climate success stories with you. Thanks for being here as we adapt to climate change one conversation at a time. In this episode, we're going to talk about climate change at the coasts and small islands and what we can do to adapt. Awesome. I love coasts. I used to work in Manhattan and one of my good friends used to like to joke that it was a small island state. Do you know that about 40% of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of the coast? I did. I'm one of them. Lucky you. So here's something to think about. Around half a billion of those people live in low-lying areas. That's where it's less than 10 meters above sea level. That means that if, if the planet's temperature rises by three degrees Celsius, many of those people's homes, farms and businesses could be inundated by seawater. Sounds grim, but remember, that's if we don't adapt. Yeah, that's right. Although sea level rise is one of the most profound and dramatic aspects of climate change, there are so many exciting innovations going on all over the world as people adapt. And you've been talking to an architect about climate resilient architecture, right? Yes, the world-renowned Björk Ingels from Denmark. My first project ever was the Copenhagen Harbour Bath, which essentially extends the life of the city of Copenhagen into the water. And I think it became kind of very instrumental in our thinking about, in this case, sustainability, because we noticed that it felt like a miracle that suddenly the Copenhageners didn't have to sit in their cars for hours to get to the beaches in the north. They could actually jump in the port in the middle of the city. And it made me sort of realize that a sustainable city is not only good for the environment, it's also much better for the life of the people inhabiting it. You actually can sw- swim in the middle of what used to be uh, an industrial port. And, and it gave us this, this idea of what we call hedonistic sustainability. The sustainable city or the sustainable building is actually not just the right thing for the environment, it's, it's much greater for the people living there. So, so that, that becomes like a, a kind of a desirable and exciting outlook for, for sustainability. And, and then maybe like fast forward, I, I moved to New York 10 years ago, shortly after Hurricane Sandy came and, and pretty much wiped out all of lower Manhattan for weeks. And, and we got invited to, to think about how we might imagine the waterfront of Manhattan in ways that could protect it from the next Sandy. And, and we thought sort of applying a similar lens, what if all the necessary hard engineering to protect the city could be designed in such a way that it would make the waterfront more accessible and more enjoyable for the people uh, living in the city. Awesome. Hedonistic sustainability. That's one I've not heard before. (laughs) Love it. Um, So you've been involved in the design of an amazing range of um, cool building projects. Uh, You've mentioned how you've been working on flood proofing Manhattan, the, the Google's new headquarters as well. I was also reading about this ski slope that is also a power plant that generates energy by burning trash. So what has been the most exciting project that you've worked on? I have become quite interested in this kind of questioning the mindset. The world and the built environment has a, a kind of mindset that distinguishes between front of house and back of house. And I think that that mindset is almost the root cause or one of the root causes for the climate crisis and, and climate change. There's, there's this idea that there's the front of house, which is, you know, all the presentable stuff that we put great care uh, and sort of consideration and detail into. And, and this is where architects are typically involved. Uh, and then there's the back of house, which we don't put that amount of care into, but that's basically the power plants the parking lots, the warehouses, the industry, uh, the ports, uh, you know, where we mine our resources. And, and, and the mindset is that we just put it away so we don't see it, except the people working there, of course. And, but then eventually we realize that there is only one earth. So there is no back of house. Eventually the back of house becomes someone else's front of house. And eventually the, the plastic that uh, is jumped in a landfill and sort of swept into the rivers 
shows up uh, on the beaches uh, somewhere else. So uh, we've started to put effort into projects that are back of house and try to consider them as carefully as you would the front of house, because there there is in reality no back of house. We had this idea that if you make the chimney tall enough, the smoke is going to go away. But then you know it just ends up accumulating in the uh, in the outer atmosphere, and and we get global warming. Or if you make the pipes long enough into the oceans, it's going to wash away. But then it ends up creating increased acidity or uh, or sort of uh, contaminating uh, different kinds of maritime environments. So in that sense, you can say that the power plant that is also a ski slope and, a, and the tallest climbing wall in the world is, is that idea that if the technology becomes clean enough, you don't have to hide it away. You can actually uh, ski on it or climb on it. We actually have a handful of projects that, that take that mindset. You can also say the, the dry line, as we've nicknamed the project that's going to keep Manhattan dry, is this idea that it's actually the hard engineering that is necessary to protect the, the city from, from flooding, but um, it's designed in a way that makes it appear as an enjoyable and inviting park. You'll see rolling hills, you see li- linear elements of furniture that are also doubles as flood protection. So, so I think that kind of expanded scope of the architect, which, which is not just opera houses or, or museums, but actually waste to energy power plants or waste recycling facilities or, or flood protection facilities can be dealt with with the same care because they will end up constituting the, the world we live in. It's a really good point there as well. I mean, the, the combination between the, the sort of concrete and, and the natural solutions like what you're doing in Manhattan, I think, is, is, is a great example because you get the, the benefits of the concrete, but then with the cost effectiveness sometimes of the, the nature based solutions. Um, so, yeah, fa- fascinating to hear about that. Um, now, the impacts of climate change are being felt really strongly on our coastal environments, um, especially when it comes to rising sea levels and hurricanes. So to what extent do climate resilient architecture and buildings provide solutions for, for dealing with this? There's different levels of uh, extreme measures and, and we're involved in, um, in both of them. One example, in addition to the, the, the dry line, is that we're designing a project in, um, in Williamsburg in Brooklyn that's called River Ring. It's basically creating this coastal resilient landscape, including um, a kayak launch and a beach, and, and eventually we hope a tidal pool for, for people to actually swim in the actual uh, water of the East River. And, and, and the ring is because it creates this kind of loop of a promenade that sort of embraces a body of water, uh, but also allows you to sort of stand out in the middle of the river and look back at the, uh, at the city. But, but there, we're trying to create this kind of soft edge. Uh, so you have a sort of layered approach with a series of different defenses that will take away the force of the, of the waves and that are actually designed to be able to withstand a certain amount of flooding so that you somehow slowly break down the energy of the waves and you slowly bring down the, the height of the waves so that when the water finally reaches the, the, the city and the buildings, th- there's so little left of it that, that all, the, all the energy has been taken away, but it also creates a very kind of beautiful, natural wetland, a kind of post-industrial uh, landscape. So, so I think th- those approaches of really understanding the different mechanisms and, and learning from biotopes or ecosystems in the, in the natural world that, that have somehow evolved over millions of years to actually deal quite well with natural disasters, that's, that's one extreme. And then I would say the other extreme is that we've been working with among others, a UN Habitat to design a floating city. And, and that's essentially, you can say that some of the island nations like French Polynesia or the Maldives, they're so low lying that probably even if we became carbon neutral tomorrow, they would still probably sink. Um, and, and there you could imagine an idea that is because the interesting thing about coral reefs, for instance, is that coral reefs are, are you know, living if they're healthy. Uh, and so if the, if the sea levels rise, the corals would, would grow w- with the sea levels, except if you already put a city on top of them. So, uh, so you could imagine a mindset where maybe all these uh, coral reef islands, uh, you turn them back into parks or nature, and you slowly move the city off the land and onto uh, floating pontoons, they can still be sheltered by the, the, the reefs, 
but then without actually migrating uh, the entire country to another place, you can say that the terra firma, the, the, the land they have actually becomes their nature and the city actually becomes floating. So, so how close do you think we are to, um, to reaching our, our first floating city? Um, I mean, there's, um, it's, it's definitely in the works. Uh, we, ha- we have a handful of projects that de- deal with it either sort of uh, partially or, uh, or more consistently. Um, but but, but I, it's, it's obviously, obviously not a new invention. Like, I mean, I, I myself live in a, in a houseboat. I live in, a, in an old Norwegian car ferry that, uh, that is, has been sort of uh, modified gently to be a, a great home. Okay. I, I also used to live in a boat in, in Oxford, actually, yeah, for a couple of years. Oh, nice. No, I, I think you, I mean, in the beginning, it's, you, you, need, you need to sort of learn uh, to, to listen to and understand uh, the old lady uh, that is the ferry. She's a 450-ton girl, so uh, she, there's some inertia, and uh, she makes certain sounds. And, and I think for me, it was quite educational because you become keenly aware of your water consumption and your, and your black water production because you have to deal with it, with that stuff. So I think it's a good, good exercise in, in, uh, towards becoming a, a more resource conscious uh, sort of global citizen. And, and then of course you also have to sort of really follow the weather, but that, that's, that's a, I'm sidetracking here. So I think of, of course, floating communities do exist in various ways. You have like the, these kind of Asian uh, like floating markets where every store is actually a boat and, and where everybody congregate in this kind of amalgamation of different kinds of, different scales of floating vessels, right? So it, it exists in various ways. And I think we uh, calculated that on a daily basis, two to three million people live at sea in, in offshore industries or in, or in shipping, et cetera. So, so there is already a significant part of humanity that is sea-based. But I think over the next decade, I think you will see some prototypical towns with larger pontoons, like sort of city block sized islands that can be connected and where you have a sort of more low to medium rise city on top and just the, the the studies we've been making is is of course when you start imagining this this kind of floating city you you need to somehow design a, a man-made ecosystem you need to harvest the the available energy from the sun you need to capture uh, the rainwater that the that, that you can you need to deal with your food production locally so so we also sort of propose that for this city a pescatarian diet would be would be the base produce and uh, and seafood because dairy and a meat-based diet would, would simply not be sustainable from a kind of waterborne point of view of ag- agriculture. Of course, people would be free to con- consume what they choose, but the city itself would be able to support its its own sustenance through uh, a pescatarian diet. So, so, so all of these things suddenly come into play when, when you start thinking about a whole new way of, of orchestrating a city. Well, uh, I've got to say, it's amazing to hear uh, an architect's perspective on, on floating cities. It's really, really interesting to, to, to hear you talk about it. Um, so what, sorry, did you want to add something? No, actually, I just wanted to say that one, one cool thing from an urbanistic point of view is that as we started looking at the floating city and we were thinking like first, uh, you know, um, a mindset of like 10,000, but then of course it could, it could expand. So, um, and normally in a city, as a city grows over time, then suddenly you, you have to sort of rethink the infrastructure and you have to make a wider boulevard and you have to, so then you have to sort of expropriate because the houses are already there now and how are you going to fit in the, the road and all this stuff. And one of the things we just like realized when we were looking at the floating city is that no matter how mature the city is, you can always reconfigure it. So, so you know, if you, you can sort of like, pull some of the, uh, the sort of uh, the, this kind of archipelago, you can reconfigure it, you can move a facility somewhere in, you can move things apart because even if things weighs, you know, thousands of tons or millions of tons, my 450 ton ferry, me and a friend, we can go out and pull the rope. And then, you know, after two or three minutes, it slowly starts moving, even if it's just two guys. So you can do the same, uh, which actually means that maybe a decade or two decades down the line, you can completely reshuffle the deck because all the elements are actually not fixed. They're floating. That is amazing. I mean, you, you've shared so many um, different adaptation solutions with us in just such a short period of time. Thank you so much, Bjork. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. You know, like I said, I used to work in New York 
And while I was there, I got the opportunity to talk to the New York City Mayor's Office about all the cool things they're doing to make their city more climate resilient. The dry line project that Bjark is working on is an awesome example. And there are all sorts of things the city is doing along those lines that make the city pretty fun to live in. And I can't even imagine how interesting and fun it would be to live in an entire city that can float. Now, you also had the chance to speak to another person who's changing people's lives. Right, that was Eritai. He's from the small island state of Kiribati in the South Pacific. Kiribati is made up of 33 islands, 20 of which are inhabited, and most of them are very low-lying. My name is Eritai, and I'm from the, the island of Kiribati. I run a project that's called The Mail since 2016. Thank you, Liz, for having me. Welcome. I'm really very happy that you're able to find the time to meet with us. Eritai, te mao has a wonderful meaning in your language. What, what does it mean? The mail means life. You know, I've always say, uh, as an islander, our life really depends on the ocean, the sky, and the land. That's beautiful. Can you tell us a bit about the Tamao project? What does it do? We developed a, a system that is hydroponic, growing plants on water. When we first started the hydroponic project, um, and still now, we can only grow not a lot of plants, but what we have grown so far is all type of vegetables, uh, Chinese cabbage, lettuce, all kind of lettuce. And then it's only a few fruits that includes cucumber, tomatoes, watermelon, rock melon. Yeah. Can you paint a picture for me? How does this system work? What does it look like? First of all, like I guess for those that are quite familiar with what the hydroponic is, hydroponic is not it's not a new knowledge in a, in a developed world, uh, but it is in Kiribati. And this particular uh, hydroponic that, that that my team and I developed, it's very simple. It's basically we're using a um, a tote. It's a plastic box, a yellow lid, and a black body. Basically, that's what it looks like. You take the lid off, you I guess, to grow your the vegetables. Yeah. You take the lids off and you actually put the water first and then you, you drill a hole on those the lids and that's where you put your butt. It's about, I say, 45 gallon. That's more. The main reason why I'm using that toad is because our places here are very small. So we're using a very small system as well uh, for, for families. And so, yeah, so basically that toad, we could only grow 10 head of lettuce or 10 heads of cabbage and about three or four cucumbers and and tomatoes in a different system as well yeah so one would be enough for one a, a couple of families it sounds like one or two households that depends on how many people live in your in your house <laughs> that's <laughs> but yeah um we recommend two or three for the people over here uh, for, for, for a family, what, two to three systems. Okay, great. Excellent. So I can picture that now in my head. Thanks for that. And why is that kind of system? Why, why would a hydroponic system be so important for an island like Kiribati? I believe one of the main reasons I'm really encouraging people to use the hydroponic is because our soil is infertile. It's not um, a lot of things that we could grow on other than coconut tree and bandana tree and those are like takes 10 years to to bear fruit yeah it, it just it's very hard to grow vegetables and fruits you know in, on our soil and so hydroponic is is it's a very simple but yet effective for, uh, given to our the situation and, and and our environment are a lot of people using hydroponics now on Kiribati we've worked with over 300 families in a family, it consists of almost 20 people living in a family. We're trying to get to more people. But right now, we're basically speaking right now. I guess we just can't grow more because we're having a difficult time producing our own fertilizer. The, the system is proven successfully. It's just that the fertilizer, that's where we, it's kind of the whole tub right now. So the, the system requires fertilizer in addition to water. It does. When we first started with the project, we actually imported the fertilizer from from California. And when we ran out of that, I successfully made my own fertilizer, but we could only grow just vegetables, just Chinese cabbage and lettuce. We've been having difficult time growing fruit 
I wish we could we could go faster than we can. People are taking care of their units, but you know, with what we have, you know, that's just that's just it. People love it, especially the moms and the women in the house. It's it's very convenient for them when they they do their cooking and they see their window and the back next to their house are growing, are looking good uh, vegetable right there. That's really great. A great success story. How do you feel that hydroponics is helping Kiribati become more resilient or adapt to the impacts of, of climate change? I guess I wanted to highlight that my my people, even you know, my ancestors have always been resilient. Living here on the island, we've we've seen a lot of changes actually. The climate is changing. The year goes by and new things keep coming up. Hydroponic is just one of the things that help uh, people to cope with the climate change, actually. Every month, we would have a high tide. The, the tide will come up to next to your house and kills all your plants. And I guess, you know, having the hydroponic next to your house, it raised, elevated above the ground, and it, it's very untouched, it's very self-contained. One of the things that helps them to, to know that there are ways. There are ways that we could cope with it. And it, like at our ancestors, I've said, you know, we've always endured and we, we live happy, you know. We always find a way. Hydroponic is it's a new knowledge and it's, it's a new technology in Kiribati. So that's one of the things that I'm grateful for. Without me discovering that knowledge, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to, um, to introduce that to my people and have them witness it for themselves how effective and how, you know, what difference it can make in their life. That's beautiful, Eritai. It's very inspiring for me. Thank you so much. And I'm sure for our listeners, it will be too. What's your dream for Kiribati? How do you see the work that you do helping to reach that that dream and vision for you? That's a very good question. Um, my dream is that Ijapana will get to every home. We just need help to create our own fertilizer, more fertilizer, so that it could widely available to everyone that are using the hydroponic. Th- that way we don't dependent on the uh, importing things from the United States. My dream would be able to get to that, you know, to get to that point where we can mass produce our own fertilizer using our own local materials. And that way we can be able to provide every homes with this system. So you can be self-sufficient. Exactly, exactly. Eritai, thank you so much for speaking with us today. And thanks for sharing your story. We wish you all the best with your project and all the other great work that you're doing. Thank you very much, Liz, for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to talk with you too and a uh, pleasure to meet you as well. Eritai from Kiribati and Bjork from Denmark, showing us just how varied the challenges are in coastal environments. But also how there are so many creative and practical ways that we can adapt. Thanks for listening. There are more adaptation success stories in our other episodes, so please do listen to those, subscribe and share. We're Liz Mullen Bernhardt and Marcus Neild, and you can find out more about our organisation, the UN Global Adaptation Network, in the show notes. This has been Resilience. Keep adapting. Penny Dale is the producer, 